Well, you're at home with Jim and Joy, and we're delighted Amen. that you have invited us into your home. Well, you know that you are an important part of the family, and we want you to be a part of this show. We want to hear from you. We want you to give us a jingle at 205-271-2980, or call us toll-free, 1-800-221-9460, Always send us an email, Jim and Joy at EWTN.com, and I promise we will respond to your email because Jim is extremely diligent <laughs> about that. Well, hon, I know that there's some things that you want to share today yeah. in light of our guest. Yeah, Carl A. Schultz is going to be sharing with us, and he particularly focuses on the story of Adam and Eve, the most important story perhaps ever told. And uh, I was thinking about you know, our place of work, Her Choice Birmingham Women's Center. And I was down there recently. And we have a lot of restaurants and stores all around us. And as I got out of my car, this young guy came up. I've seen him before. We've had a little interaction, but not anything really too intimate. And so he came up to me and he said, I want you to know I got married. And I said, oh, how, how nice. I mean, the guy comes right up. He wants me to know he's married. I said, I said that's really wonderful. And I said his name because I knew his name. And, um, he started talking about money a little bit. He had concerns about money previously, but when he saw his bride coming down the aisle, all that went away. Mm -hmm. And he was just so, so happy to be married. And then he said, you know, I wasn't doing it right. We weren't doing it right. And I really felt if God was going to bless me, we needed to do it right. And so we had a conversation about marriage, that marriage is doing it right. If you're going to be in... Uh, an intimate relationship with another, it needs to be in that vessel of marriage. So we had that conversation, and then later that day, we were to meet with a group of 30 teenagers that were visiting our center, our pregnancy medical center, and we always get to share with them about chastity, modesty, about embracing life, abortion, because that's what we try to prevent at our center. And when I spoke with the young guys and ladies, I said, I shared about the guy who came to me. And I said, he came to me and said, we were doing it wrong, but now we're doing it right. And I said to him, what did he mean they were doing it wrong? And they were hesitant to speak up, but then we started speaking about violations against chastity and against marriage. And what does it mean to do it right? Because one of the worst symptoms of not doing it right is abortion. Mm -hmm. Because we haven't made that commitment to lifelong, monogamous, irreplaceable, open to life commitment, which is called marriage. And, and anyway, uh, it's so powerful. We've got to go back to the beginning. Mm. You know, when you drive down the road and, you, and you're kind of lost, you've got to ask the question, where did I make the wrong turn? Mm -hmm. And really, too many of us in the church and society as a whole, we don't get Adam and Eve. Mm -hmm. We don't get in the beginning, God created us, male female and that we are to be together and open to, to like the marriage covenant and I'm really looking forward to what Carl A. Schultz has to say to us today because that's the road to renewal. Mm -hmm. This sort of understanding of God's plan, his giving us the power to love one another in the midst of this vessel and to welcome life, to do it right as the young man said. We were doing it wrong. He actually believes in a right and a wrong. That's pretty novel mm -hmm. in these days. And it really feels like, you know, God's blessing us now because we're moving in the right way. God's blessing everyone. He loves everyone. But there is a right way. And there is lesser ways or wrong ways to of, really love, to give right. yourself. And of pain and of great consequences. And especially in this year of divine yeah. mercy and just mm -hmm. coming out of the beauty of Easter. And uh, really trying to reset ourselves. Amen. And, you know, the only marriage I'm responsible for is this marriage. I mean, we, we, we speak it, we live it, we love it, and, and we encourage others into it. But ultimately, at the end of the day, this is the only one I'm responsible for. And what we do is in life, when we make a wrong turn, the problem is we're not saying, where did I go wrong? We just keep making more and more and more wrong turns until we've created a great mess. Yeah. And we see it daily with women yeah. and men who've made poor life choices. Um, but it's the beauty of hope. It's the beauty of 
revival. It's a review. It's the beauty of waking up and saying, I want to be controlled by the Holy Spirit this day in all of my passions and all of my beliefs and what I think, what I think, that's where the problem is, what I think what marriage is, what I think who I am, my own gender, my own sexuality, right. my own personhood. But it's not. It's what God really? says because he's the creator of life. He's the author of this whole thing. And so um, that's where we have to get back to. And I, I really believe in, in today's discussion with Carl that um, we're going to reveal more truth and Amen. we all need more truth. And if we've all made mistakes and taken different detours, there's always grace, there's always hope to come back into the church and to fall down on our knees before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and say, it's me, Lord, I need mercy, I need grace, reset me. Carl A. Schultz.com. He's up next. Let's get the true meaning of marriage and live it. We'll be right back. Don't go away. Welcome back. Well, you're at home with Jim and Joy. This is a live show. We're live human beings. Thank you, Jesus. And we want to hear from you. So give us a jingle at 205-271-2980 or call us toll free 1-800-221-9460. Always send us an email, jimandjoy at ewtn.com. Well, we shared with you in the beginning that we were going to have a wonderful guest who was going to talk to us about the beginning. His name is Carl A. Schultz. You could go to his website. It's carlaschultz.com. He's the author of various books, and they're also at ewtnrc.com. Or you can go right to that website, or you can call 1-800-854-6316 if you like all the things that Carl is going to share with us today. Well, Carl, welcome to At Home with Jim and Joy. It's delighted to have you here, and you are also a Pittsburgh man. Yeah, I, I uh, originally was from Pittsburgh, but I lived other places, and now I'm in Daytona Beach, Florida. Okay, so that's one thing we shared in common. For three short years of our lives, right. very gray and cold years, we lived in Pittsburgh, too. Well, tell us, tell us um, how you came to this point and place in your life where you're so passionate about Adam and Eve. Well, the, it, it comes from... The interest in how our sexuality or gender relates to our human development. And there's not been much work done on that in the secular world as well as in the, um, the Christian or, or spiritual uh, realm. And I began my, my center focusing on Job, dealing with a question of suffering, and did workshops for nurses so that RNs could get accreditation by taking using Lexio Divina as a model of therapy using the book of Job. What so, do you mean by Lexio Divina? Le Lexio Divina is Latin for divine reading. It's the sort of the official church ancient way mm -hmm. of holistically playing the scriptures. It's reading, meditation, mm -hmm. prayer, contemplation, and action. And it actually goes back to the beginning. It goes back to the way the Jewish people prayed the, the scriptures when they were first going from an oral to a written culture. So it's a seminal model. It's the natural way people do it. And there's parallels in Judaism as well as in Islam. So that was how I mm -hmm. began doing it, focusing on scripture. First, the book of Job, and then I did various applications of Lexio to time management, stress management, journaling, because journaling is very helpful. Mm -hmm. The scriptures is, in this sense, God's message us, and we, we journal, we write back. And then a book, Become a Community, on conflict resolution and Lexio Divina on relationships. And then various introductions, the how-to book of the Bible and the St. Joseph Guide to Lexio and to the Bible so that I was looking at, and then how to pray with the Bible. So the whole focus was on Lexio Divina, mm -hmm. because my focus is on how we submit to the Word. The key to really understanding the Scriptures effectively is to let the Word judge you, mm -hmm. because when the Word judges you, and I know France, Pope Francis would agree, it always judges us mercifully, you mm -hmm. see, that's the thing. Mm -hmm. And we, and many viewers are 
worried, less so now, about private interpretation. You don't get in trouble with the Bible if you apply it to yourself mm -hmm. and let God judge you and leave it in, in His hands. So that's how I began doing it. And then I've had a lot of very positive feminine influence in my life, beginning with my mother. And you can't, you can't overestimate how when you have a, a good family mm -hmm. foundation mm -hmm. and you know, the first girlfriend I had was very positive for me. She supported me. I got Lexio Divina from her, you mm -hmm. see. So pre pretty much most of the good stuff I have, I got from women, mm -hmm. basically. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's why they feel free to criticize me, mm -hmm. you see, because, you know, I got it from them. So anyways, and criticism in a sense of getting to the deeper meaning of things. So that's how I got it. And then the, the story of Adam and Eve became interesting to me because I, I saw how in, in our world there's an unnatural conflict between men and women. It's always going to be there because of original sin. And also we're different, so there's always going to be a healthy tension. And when, when we discuss Genesis 3 and, ch and ch chapter 2, I'll uh, address that. But it, it, it's inflamed by both machismo and ideological feminism. These external things come and start programming and conditioning and they create a world we live in. They affect our laws, they affect our economic system, social, and, and the church lives in that and sometimes the churches are affected by it, not just Catholic, the others. So I wanted- What do you mean by machismo and ideological feminism? Okay. What do they look like? Well, well I it? think, just to, just to be quick and funny, if you look at, at the, the two leading presidential candidates now, we've got one machismo, mm -hmm. and then we've got one ideological feminism. I'll, and I'll just show you how relevant it is in the political world. You can see examples of the way they both misuse, misuse power, different ways of misusing power. Machismo is, is violence. It's a desire to oppress. It's uh, sort of the, the, the worst shadow side of masculinity. So, and if, does it tie into dominance? Yes, dominance. And... and and, and the attributes of machismo can be in women, just like the attribute ideological feminism. And it, I know it, this works with your, your work, um, her choice about, um, and the, pro the primary thing is the decision that a woman somehow can decide over life. Mm -hmm. See, and that's mm -hmm. actually, so ideological feminism is appropriating the worst aspects of machismo. It's like, I, like Hitler and Stalin, Nazism and communism. They meet at the other side, even though they're ideologically opposed. So. I'm looking at those two things as a way that are, are contrary to Scripture, and Adam and Eve gives us a positive model in which to address it in a collaborative way rather than a competitive. See, because uh, 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 the, the founder of Large Father, uh, Jean Vanier, said, competition kills community. Mm -hmm. So what we need to do is collaborate. Right. And, and that, the benefits of that in a marriage, in a family, in a workplace, I mean, that's a wise statement, right? Yeah, and, and I, th I want to preface all my comments that we can't live up to the scriptures. Mm -hmm. See, and, and you know, at one of the things I, you know, I would discuss with people is that the classic wives be submissive to your husbands as to the Lord. And then the end, what people forget is, and when Paul says, even if you don't get all this, wives respect your husbands and husbands love your wives as yourself. Mm -hmm. right. So look at the submission as respect. It's, it's not a question of groveling. It's a mm -hmm. question of respect, a natural, and then the husband loving your wives as yourself, which is a reference to Genesis. But nobody can live up to that. Mm -hmm. So if women have trouble with some of the things that I say, because I'm coming from a masculine perspective, so you have to filter all this because my, my experiences influence it. The point is, it's, it's, it's an ideal. You shoot towards it. That's part of being Catholic. We set the goal high, mm -hmm. and if we fall short, we rely on the mercy of God. Mm -hmm. And I would, I'm, I'm going to try to share various scriptures, and the one that's going to maybe surprise some of us is in chapter 18 of Matthew, the last story about the parable of the unjust steward. That was called a little <clears throat> literary masterpiece by a leading scripture scholar because it talks about the importance of forgiveness. So over all this, and you know in marriage, the underlying thing is you have to forgive mm -hmm. because people are going to fall short. Mm -hmm. And um, that's why Pope Francis is uh, affecting mercy. And if, if you're angry, you're hurt from somebody who's hurt you in the past, there is, and true power that feminists and macho don't understand is forgiveness right. and not letting not having them cause you to act in a way against your own integrity right. and against their dignity of the person and realizing that as much as we've sinned, uh, as much as others have hurt us, we've also hurt other people. Mm -hmm. So, and God has forgiven mm -hmm. us all the more. So take mm -hmm. us back we, to the beginning. Why is, why, why do you go to Genesis 1, 2, and 3? Why Adam and Eve? What was the original intent? What's there? What can we learn from this versus where we are now? 
Well, I, I, I actually, I'm going to follow John Paul in Theology of the Body and go to Jesus, because when they asked him about divorce, which is really a root evil, because what does God say about divorce? I hate divorce, and that's in Malachi, and he talks about the, the Hebrews abandoning the wives of your youth. And we see that now going. Unfortunately, women are doing that now too. Uh, there's you know, a, a term, the walk away wife, that we don't hear about because now it's, it's, unf it's, it's like a plague. And Jesus, when he was asked about divorce, because the, the men were putting away their, their, their uh, spouses and justifying it with the Mosaic law, and he said, it was not like that from the beginning. So he quotes both the first and second creation story, Genesis chapter one in Genesis uh, chapter 2 and then he said and then the apostles being typical men or human beings say if this is how it is between you know because Jesus said no divorce period mm -hmm. if this is how it is between a man and his wife it is no wonder that um, it's better not to marry and then Jesus deals with that and that passage is one of the few that deals with the the tragedy of the ab abandoned spouse or mm -hmm. quote the innocent spouse no one's truly innocent but that's a very painful part but the scriptures uh, we look at Jesus going back to that. And then the other thing I want to reference is Tobit chapter 2. It's beautiful. And then yeah. chapter 9, that's a prayer that people should mm -hmm. pray. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just, it's, and the whole, in, in, in the book of Tobit, T Tobit and Anna get into a big fight that's generated out of both of their justice. So the point is, if we're having conflict and gender issues, it doesn't mean that we're bad people. Sometimes right. God allows us to be mm -hmm. tested, mm -hmm. and we have, and that's why we have to submit ourselves to Scripture. The passage in Tobit, I don't have it memorized, but I have, prayed it before, uh, they actually, the couple that's, that's just been wedded to each other, and, and the problem is, again, this woman's been wedded and seven, seven, seven husbands, times, the yeah. demon right. kills, but they do reference, uh, the one praying the prayer re references the Genesis Absolutely. passage, Adam and, and Eve, goes he says, into this Adam, prayer and, and, he said, and burns the incense yep. and says, I, I don't take her out of lust, lust you know, that I take her. but he does reference exactly the Genesis passage. Absolutely, that's mm -hmm. why, and then... Uh, th there's other references, St. Paul in, ch in chapter 5, the a letter to the Ephesians. There's a, these beautiful references to that. Um, but I think Jesus, the one I want to focus on is Jesus's because he said no divorce. Mm -hmm. and, and he knows the shadow side of human beings better than anybody else. And that's one thing we want to work on. And the other point I want to make is John Paul in interpreting scripture and theology of the body and his other documents developed what I term a reciprocal ethic, which means that the passages that apply to one sex or gender can be applied to the other. That was a wonderful innovation. So if you see a part like Hosea, Hosea is dealing with an unfaithful wife. Mm -hmm. There are wives with unfaithful husbands, plenty of those mm -hmm. to go around. Mm -hmm. So the point is you invert it. You take what, are, there's a human value in it and there's a gender specific thing. But the, the last thing before I guess the break is in Genesis 127, it says God created mankind in his own image in his own image he created him, male and female he created them. In one verse, he distinguishes mankind as humankind, him or the individual, and male and female, sexuality. So the point is, when, I, when we generalize on this, everything is circumstantial. We're all human, we all have our sexual identity, and we're all individuals. Mm -hmm. So there's a limit to the generalizations, and everyone needs to, that's why I subject themselves in prayer to Lexio in dialogue with the church and hopefully your spouse and, and spiritual director or friends and to let the scriptures judge you and reveal what God is trying to speak to you. Mm -hmm. And that's always our spiritual journey, right? I mean, we're even in marriage and, and we make mistakes and we don't intentionally mean to hurt each other, but we do. And, and it's the beauty of, um, it, and some, we had a fight one time over love. Like, how do you fight over love? The term. the term love, but we did. When, <laughs> this is that's not right love. That's not wrong love. But what we did was you have to both then come to the Lord, who's then going to judge you and say, maybe you were wrong, maybe you were right, and then we had to forgive, and so that we can repair the injury that we cause either in <clears throat> word or attitude or judgments and and prejudices how we felt about it. But that's that's how that works in the, in the beauty of the conversation and not competing to be right even in an argument. And, and you know, I want to bring in St. Joseph and Mary, because I got to, just on a funny note, he's women's second favorite saint. You know, Mary is a favorite. Mm -hmm. Why St. Joseph? First of all, um, he's chaste, no pressure for sex. He, he, he rears Jesus well. 
Um, he's respectful of Mary. And if there's ever a problem in the family, there's only one person who you can blame. It's the man, mm -hmm. St. Joseph. I kid about that. But I think true power is in Matthew chapter 1, 18 to 25, is when Joseph perceived that when, when he saw that Mary was pregnant, he knew that it wasn't from him. What did he do? And this comes up with what, what Pope Francis has said. He said he was a just, her husband Joseph was a just mm -hmm. man, yet unwilling to expose her to shame. And Francis just came out with a new apostolic expectation. And you were talking about love. He, he, he describes love. And he does a wonderful uh, exposition on the expression, love bears all things. When we hear that, we think it means we go with it. The word bear there means it bears it inside, meaning we don't slander people. We respect the confidentiality of their relationship. We don't go public. We don't shame. And that all goes back to Adam and Eve. And so I would, I would highly recommend what Francis says there, his exposition of love and the rest of the document. Okay, well, we're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, we'll have some emails, and we will have more of this discussion with Carl, so don't go away. We'll be right back. Back where you're at home with Jim and Joy, and we are having a very enriching and enlightening conversation with Carl Schultz. And we have an email that has just come in. It said, What is the original sin that we all have? Is it the same sin? I know that Adam and Eve ate the fruit when they weren't supposed to, but which sin would that be classified as? Disobedience, pride, or arrogance? And this is from Fran. Uh, thank you for your question, Fran. What, what I'd like to do is to explain it in the context. Uh, Fran, we, we need to see that the, the creation stories, there's really two that are integrated. There's Genesis 1, so it's important we understand Genesis 1 is just beautiful and everything is good. And that was composed in the post-exilic probably in the fifth or sixth century. And that was composed in a culture, the Babylonian culture, where they had this, this um, creation story, the Enuma Elish, that promoted Babylonian politics and the king and it gave, it, it was very depressing to the Israelites because they thought our God is lost. We're, we've lost everything. The only thing they had left was the word and that's why the word creates there. So Genesis 1 has that beautiful, and uh, in, in, in the height of it is the creation of, of humankind in day six and that was very good. And that's, and, and again, the absolute equality of male and female, that's another point we want to get out of these in both things. Right. And it's the first story from ancient times where men and women are absolutely equal. There's nothing in it that even you could argue against it. So that's the first story. And, and the other thing, the first story is it really is about time. And then the other point is it, it, it God bless the, the Sabbath. So in terms of love, we need to respect the Sabbath and make Sunday a holy day. Now, Fran asked about uh, original sin. Right. We have to first go to original blessing. We have to look at chapter two and, and, and what went wrong. Uh, in, in chapter two is human beings are created uh, out, of the, out of the earth. The man, so to speak, Adam, Adam is related to Adama, the earth, and it means we're not God, we're in the image of God. So basically, Genesis two and three explains what it means to be the image of God. And, and original sin is how we fouled that up. So Adam was created out of the uh, earth and he was, he was told to till the soil and to, to guard it. So it wasn't like you lay back, do anything you want. It was, you know, it was gonna be a tough life because in Palestine, it's not easy to be a farmer. So they had to, to, to you know, God gave us something to do. He wanted us to exercise dominion. It wasn't gonna be easy. And then it talks about the, the, the four rivers. And it's interesting, it, it, the only two rivers we're sure where they are, the Tigris and Euphrates, which is in Mesopotamia, which is where we believe civilization began in Sumer. So it's interesting that they even had a sense of where it all began. Hmm. The other thing that's interesting is that um, Genesis 1, I mentioned Enuma Elish, it's very different than that. There's, there's only a couple possible similarities, but it's really, despite all these pagan stories, it's really, it's, it's a unique story. However, Adam and Eve does have some similarities with a story called the Epic of Atrahasis, which it wasn't until 1969 that we had all the scrolls, or they were, all the tablets were available. So the point is that just as in we're in a secular world, they lived in a secular world where they had to, you know, deal with, and not all 
the, the, the pagan stories, everything in it, it wasn't bad. Scholars who study them will point out that there were some good values in it. Just the church's attitude to the world, we, want to, we don't want to condemn what is good. We want to try to see what's good and maybe reform it. But in Genesis 2 is, is when um, God, then Adam is, uh, the human person, is given the command about not to eat from the fruit of the right. tree of knowledge. And this hits Fran's question. Um, all of this that I'm getting is from Father Jean-Louis Scott from the Biblicum. He's a friend of mine, and um, he, his, his interpretation, which I think is profound, is what is the knowledge of good and evil? In the Bible, the, the knowledge of good and evil means probably several things. It means the knowledge of what is harmful and what is helpful to human existence. Okay, because it's referenced in um, several books of the Old Testament. Children don't, don't have the knowledge of good. They don't know good and evil, nor do people who are older, who are losing their, their, their faculty, so to speak. They don't know it. So the knowledge of good and evil, one, mes one meaning is what is helpful or harmful to life. Another way you can look at it is it's a merism. It's totality. It means knowledge of everything. The other point is it may have some sexual connotations because the word yada in Hebrew no means um, the sexuality. And of course, there's some sexual imagery in, um, in those chapters as well. But the, we're, we're, we're given all these trees are good to, to eat and are pleasing to look at, but we're, there's the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. The tree of life is a motif that's familiar to us from the other pagan stories, and it, that's what the focus is, because they, you know, they were after the quest for eternal life. It's not the focus in, in this story. The tree of knowledge of good and evil is only found in this passage. It's nowhere else in ancient literature, and it's not mentioned elsewhere in the Bible. So this tree of knowledge of good and evil is basically a tree of limitations. It's a tree of only God really knows good and evil. He, you know, and that's, it, it's our, our unwillingness to accept you know, the limitations of humanity. Mm -hmm. And Father Scott's in, uh, insight, which is good, is it's not the knowledge that's prohibited, it's the eating of it. And the word eat is mentioned 16 times in those first several chapters. And eating is a very natural thing. And, and the point there is that the knowledge of good and evil, the way to a happy and blissful and a moral existence is different than the way than, than the than fulfillment of our appetites and desires from things that are nice to look at and pleasing to the ascetic and pleasing to the senses. It's something where we have to make free, conscious, and responsible choices. And that's why, um, that's part of the thing with original sin. And then, we, we ha and then it moves from there to the creation of woman. And I have to, 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 um, to go into this. This is really, for if any women have any esteem issues or they have hurt, there, there's no passage probably in all of literature that's more affirming of women because they're in a sense sort of the crescendo of creation. Man was made, was. God was a potter. He made human beings from the clay of the ground. And woman comes from man's rib or his side. Mm -hmm. And that word helper corresponding to him, that word helper, everyone, most people know it's not a negative word, it's a positive, but it's more than just a helper. It's used to describe God in military context. And a better term might be a sustainer, almost like a redeemer. Right. So the point there, the vocation of women is to really help or uplift the man. And we know that basically a woman has a lot more influence over a man than society will, will, will admit. And that's partly why I think the serpent talked to the woman, because if she can get him on her side, then the man will fall into line. Mm -hmm. So this passage, it's interesting when, and, and God puts him to sleep, and the word tardama for putting him to sleep is a covenantal word that's used in 15.2 of Genesis when Abraham went to sleep. So the point is it's a covenantal uh, pers per perspective. And God puts him to sleep, and men don't like pain, so they needed to sleep to avoid the pain of the, uh, the operation. And then he, he brings them to the man. And, you know, he, and John Paul, in his um, uh, Theology of the Body, talks about original solitude and breaking the circle of solitude. And many people get married without knowing themselves. They don't mm -hmm. do the point of, of distinguishing themselves from the animals or, or coming to a sense of their own identity. Mm -hmm. And when they look for a spouse, they're often not doing it out of freedom. They're not acting out of freedom. They're acting, they want to get out of the house or, or some other mm -hmm. thing. So when he brings her to the man like the father, the father of the bride, the typical male gets tongue-tied. You see, when we men we meet a woman that we love, we, you know, the words don't come out well. And, and, and the, the Hebrew word zot is repeated three times, and it's what's called an inclusion. So it's meant to set it apart. So it says, this time, this one is it. So mm -hmm. finally, right. bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. That means we're made of the same stuff. And it also means, because 
it's used when people came to David, it means somebody who is going to be loyal. We're, we're of the same right. stuff. Yeah. You, we, we, we come from the same, and literally she came from him, and uh, bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh, she shall be called woman. Now, in the old New American Bible translation, it says, because from her man. It's mm -hmm. interesting. Now they, they changed it to man, but I like her man is because several ancient translations, the Samaritan Pentateuch and the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, use her man. So mm -hmm. that's an alternate, but it's beautiful. It's like, it is beautiful. That, 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 you know, it's her man. She identifies mm -hmm. with him. Mm -hmm. And, 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 and to, now I need to be critical of men. Women are God's gift for us. We need women much more than, than you need us. That's biologically true but it, from, from you know, beginning to end of life. We're dependent on women, and, and, and therefore we should be appreciative. So that's the first thing we should do is be appreciative, and that's where problems come. But after this beautiful, and then, um, and after this beautiful, and it's poetry, and by the way, I'll throw this in, all the best love songs are written by men. If you don't believe me, email me, because you, mm -hmm. you show me uh, 10 good love songs written by women, I'm not going to find them, because mm -hmm. they're all written about women, because mm -hmm. just like Adam, it's like the experience, and John mm -hmm. Paul talks about this too. And then finally, the, the thing that's beautiful is they were naked and unashamed. Mm -hmm. Now, nakedness in the Bible, four categories, children, prisoners of war, slaves, and condemn men. So it hints vulnerability. Mm -hmm. It means they were vulnerable before each other, but they were not ashamed. And the word ashamed means to be excluded from a community. So the point is in that original unity in innocence, they accepted each other. It's almost like before, you know, the honeymoon period. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then getting to Fran's question, we have the original, we have the, the temptation and the serpent is the most commonly represented animal in the middle, in, the, in, in all really religions, and it was a symbol of divinity. And the fertility cults were a constant temptation for the Israelites to go to those. The prophets mm -hmm. are always railing about it because, and, and we have our fertility cults today too, mm -hmm. you see. Mm -hmm. we, they're just different terminology. And um, the point is because we, we don't want to trust God with bringing with good and evil, mm -hmm. we want to find it ourselves. Mm -hmm. Let's just hold right there for a minute. I appreciate you if you could take that email. Okay, good. <laughs> I'm going to go straight to another email. It says, I have a feminist friend who claims to be a Christian, but she rejects many stories in the Bible because they are too patriarchal or misogynistic. One of these stories is Adam and Eve. And she says it's misogynistic because it suggests that women should take the blame for humanity's fall, and that women are being punished with painful childbirth because of original sin. What can I tell her? This is Rhonda. Well, well Rhonda, that, 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 kind of, that leads actually into the whole thing. First of all, the, the story needs to be understood as an etiological narrative, meaning explaining the origins or causes of this. Now, um, why, does, why does the serpent talk to Eve? My, first of all, the first thing he says is, did God really say? There's a technical term that I won't get into now for. It's a leading question designed to provoke an answer. Women can multitask better than men, and they're good at finishing sentences and talking and listening at the same time. We know we men can't do that. We're focused on one thing, but they can do it, and we get into trouble when the women finish our sentences the way they want, not what we want. We don't know it. Then they have us. But no. Uh, I'm not going to respond to that. Yeah, that's a good, yeah, that's a good suggestion. Okay. But anyways, what, you know, uh, why Eve? Because first of all, women are interested in spirituality and also in the ancient world. And today, women have always been more interested in the occult, fortune tellers, astrologies. And women were, were used as the temple prostitutes as a way to tempt the man. So that's why in that, quote, patriarchal culture, the, the, the Eve is, is, is talking with Adam because also women have influence over a man. And so the serpent is, and then when Eve gives the, you know, Eve is trying to be right for God. She, she, you know, she's innocent. And it said that the serpent was more shrewd than all the other animals. Shrewd and nude in Hebrew, erum and erum, and erum sound similar. So it's a play on the innocence and vulnerability of the, the couple versus the shrewdness of the snake. And then she enlarges the prohibition. She says, or even touch it. See, God never said not to touch it. And my reading of that is sometimes, you know, you often hear about women with like teenage daughters that drama, you know, the mm -hmm. drama. Mm -hmm. They like to embellish things. That's not necessarily a bad thing. They exaggerate but, but the emotion. So anyways, we have this. And then the, 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 the temptation comes down to, and then the woman saw that it was good, you know, pleasing, good for food, pleasing to the eyes, and desirable for gaining wisdom. The word wisdom there 
is a certain kind of practical wisdom that leads to success. So that ties into the knowledge of good and evil. So how can a, a, a fruit give you um, uh, a wisdom? And that's why you, when I use the word etiological, eat, they see it, it's illogical. So in other words, she grabs the fruit because, and, and again, she does it as a woman, but she does it as a human person, and, and the man who is with her also grabs it. So they both equally sin. That's the point of it, and 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 so. Yeah, plus, I, I think in that story too, and it seems in God's creation of man that he is to be a protector, and it seems to me that Adam doesn't step up. He's pretty silent in this deal, you know. So he's not playing his role in terms of complementarity and being there and taking responsibility to be a guardian. And he's not really guarding that woman. He's not doing his job. I agree. And, yeah. you know, there's a real problem today. We've talked before, uh, Jim, about the marginalization of men. Men are not participating in the family as much and in church and so forth. That's a real problem. And there's a certain passivity that men have. And, and again, um, men want, you know, in, in my opinion, this is my bias, I believe that God wants men to be leaders. I believe there's a reason he gave the command to Adam. It's not superiority in any way, but it's leadership, so to speak. And there's a complementarity, and they need each other. And I think in our culture, um, men have, have kind of, you know, we need to challenge the ideological extremists, but most of all, we need to reach out to women. And that the statement, the 2004 yeah. statement on collaboration, we need to collaborate. And, <laughs> yeah, and that agree. statement mm -hmm. says yeah. that the problem of feminism is they see, they, there were, men have oppressed women, and women have oppressed men, but they respond, feminists respond to conditions of oppression by trying to gain power. And that's not what you do. Right. It's instead we want to see collaboration and we want to respect the differences between men and women because they're the design of God and the church has always affirmed those. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're going to go straight to another email. Okay, it says, it seems as though the American media can find no middle ground between being pro-woman and calling people sexist. Any politician who is against abortion is accused of wanting to control and suppress women, especially if the politician is male. Contrast that with the Catholic Church's beautiful view of women who are uplifted and their dignity is shown. Why don't people listen to the church? and show the dignity of both sexes. And this is Josephine from Vermont. Josephine, that's, these questions are good. They're really leading into what we're mm -hmm. going to talk about. After they take the fruit, what do they do? They blame each other. Now I've got to be tough on the man. The man is even worse. He, you know, God calls them out. So we now move before from the snake. And by the way, the snake represents natural life. You see, and that's what in the secular world, and it, not just feminist, machismo, all, the whole thing. Um, it's natural life. Is it, you know, you know, go for all the gusto, that kind of thing. And the snake also crawls along the ground, which we are taken from. So the snake knows the secret of that. And it, and it can also stand for the dark, uh, under, you know, unconscious desires that we have that we don't, we don't always channel. So whenever, whenever the sin is, and God lifts us up, he brings us to the world of the language. The world of the snake is not language. He talks to Eve and then that's all. God doesn't even, God talks to him, the snake doesn't talk back. So one of the things we need to do is dialogue, but there are even limits to dialogue. But God, whenever there's the sin, God doesn't condemn. He asks, where are you? Where, you know, what has happened now? Because they're ashamed. They now, and you know, that's why marriage, as you know this, people need to be prepared for difficulties in marriage because the serpent, and again, the snake wasn't the devil originally, but later Christian and Jewish interpreters said, okay, they saw the serpent in there, although that wasn't originally the thought. But the, the, the whole thing of blaming, um, Adam, bl you know, Adam blames the woman whom you put here with me. So wait a minute. You know, he was, he was practically, you know, falling all over himself, praising even. They said, the woman whom you, pl you put here, she gave it to me, and so I ate. Mm -hmm. See, so they finally missed. And then the woman says, the serpent tricked me. And I ate. And what I think it's interesting, because God says to Eve, why have you done this? Eve doesn't say, I ate it and gave it to Adam. All mm -hmm. she says is that I ate it. So in other words, what I'm saying is, and, and what is it when, when there's divorce or a break in a relationship? They keep blaming each other. Nobody, mm -hmm. nobody looks at what they did. You see, it's, it's always blame, shame. What is shame. my part in this? Yeah, blame, mm -hmm. shame, defame and gaming. Mm -hmm. And then we have the punishments, and the, I'll focus on, in reference to her question, which was a very good one, the punishments, and she's talked about childbirth. That again is that etiological explanation of the beauty, it's, and neither of the male or female are cursed. It's only the ground that's cursed and the serpent that's cursed. And, and 
the, the, that was an explanation for why the great birth, the great birth pangs. And it's true, the men have, and we still are, the pain of, of childbirth, you know, is very intense, as you know. I don't think we men could handle it. God, we only got about a minute left. Okay. So what do we take from this in summary to be better equipped to live the way the Lord would have us to live in relationships? I would say the thing is basically, the first thing is we need to forgive. The second thing we need to do is to do the Lectio. I would follow the uh, liturgical cycle, starting with the Sunday readings, and I would, I would submit ourselves, and then I think a journal is good, you mm -hmm. know, to write it down, and I think, and, 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 to re and, and then to take as our model Mary and Joseph. That was one of the series I did here in a mm -hmm. book I wrote on pr sharing the word with the Holy Family, because they're the ones, and they're the true model, Mary of femininity and Joseph of masculinity. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what that's kind of what I would like to take. And people are welcome to email me and disagree. And I encourage disagreement because mm -hmm. that's how I learn, you know. And I admit I'm biased, but uh, and you know I, I like to get other perspectives. Well, thank you so much for sharing just some of the richness in the beginning and the greatest story ever told, one of the greatest stories ever told, Adam and Eve. Well, we're going to take a break, but if you want to get more of Carl's books, you can get them at EWTNRC.com or you can call 1-800-854-6316 or you can always go to Carl's website. It's CarlAschultz.com. Well, we're going to take a break and when we come back, Father Joseph will be with us and we're going to get to hear from Joan who's in Rome. So don't go away. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Well, you are an important part of the family, and you know what? We would love to have you come and join us here live. You could come and meet our guests. You could meet Father. You could sit in the audience. You could take a beautiful tour of this wonderful facility. You could go up to Hansville, and you can visit with Mother in her resting place. Amen. All you have to do is contact the EWTN Pilgrimage Department, or you can do that by emailing pilgrimages at EWTN.com. We would love to have you. Give them a call, 205-271-2966. Alabama is just a lovely place to Amen. be. Well, Beautiful. right now we're going to go way across to Rome and hear what Joan has for us. Joan, what do you have for us today? Well, greetings from Rome. As the Jubilee of Mercy celebrations continue, you can probably see it behind me and thousands of people in front of me as well. Now, as you know, last weekend, Pope Francis's post-synodal exhortation, much anticipated, was released to the public. And it was called The Joy of Love, and it covered the last two synods on the families, 2014 and 2015. Now, interesting enough, the word joy in the title is similar to his first exhortation, which was Evangelii Gaudium, the joy of the gospel. Now, in this, we see that this document echoes the words of John Paul. Here's what the Pope wrote. The family remains a primary and most important concern of the church's life and ministry. As the family goes, so goes the church, and so goes human society as a whole. The Pope wrote some beautiful poetic words. He said the Bible is full of families, births, love stories, and family crises. This is true from the very first page, he said, with the appearance of Adam and Eve's family, with all the violence, but also its enduring strength. In fact, said Francis, the majestic early chapters of Genesis present the human couple in its deepest reality. These first pages of the Bible, he said, make a number of very clear statements. The first, which Jesus paraphrases, says that God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. The Pope writes, the couple that loves and begets life is a true living icon, capable of re revealing God the creator and savior. 
He says the ability of human couples to beget life is the path along which the history of salvation progresses. And Francis says yet another page of Genesis depicts a splendid, detailed portrait of the couple, how Adam and Eve are joined together, how they become one. And he said this bespeaks a profound harmony, a closeness both physical and interior. Well, this is just a, a nanosecond of a look at this amazing, far-reaching document. A lot more to come. I mean, it talks about family, love, marriage, children. So much to come, but back to you at home. so much, Joan, another wonderful report. And yes. our, our show today is just soaked with Adam and Eve, mm -hmm. life, marriage, the, the gospel of life, marriage, and the family. Your thoughts, Father? Yes, what Joan, quoting Pope Francis, talked about how the family is a living icon, mm. you know, of the inner life of yeah. God. Right. And I was thinking of this family that I know and I've grown close to. Uh, they work, uh, the fa father works for EWTN. He's got 10 children. And so I've been at First Communions and visited their home. And so one time we had the first Holy Communion of their oldest girl, Philomena. And we had gone to the all stake there in Coleman to celebrate. And so we were just there and the little children were there right. and they were dressed nicely and they were little children, but they were, you know, there was a certain <coughs> beauty about that. And this older couple comes up and they said, thank you. Mm -hmm. They said, thank you. We never see this anymore. And it just struck me the beauty of Catholic family life. Yeah. When we live in accord with God's yeah. plan, that a husband and a wife yeah. are not in competition, as right. Carl brought out, yeah. mm -hmm. but there's a complementarity in their differences mm -hmm. that enriches the whole family. Yeah. And mm -hmm. what a witness, right? What yes. a beautiful witness that was, and it is true. Sorry to say, the world doesn't see that. Mm -hmm. But when it does, the wise ones of the world acknowledge it and says, that is good. Right. Yeah. right? And that whole idea that you're bringing forth, which is so true to the faith, is you know, seeing is believing. And that Christianity is a way mm -hmm. of seeing. Right. And, uh, and that's something that I've really grown in understanding the teaching more fully of St. John Paul II. And that it's not simply a doctrinal teaching about the human person and marriage and the family, but that God is a relational being, mm -hmm. Trinitarian, right. Father, Son, right. Holy Spirit, in relation. And that being made in the image and likeness of God is that we're relational beings mm -hmm. and that as we love one another in our marriage, that people see the love of Christ for the church. As we have children, they mm -hmm. see more fully the Trinity. Right. In you, they see your weddedness mm -hmm. to the church. We see where we're going that we're supposed to be wedded to the Lord in the end. It's not even our weddedness, it's that we're all wedded to Him, and that's what you're about here, it seems to me. Right. You're showing us that. But it's seeing, and so it's not just simply explaining the doctrine, and maybe at the beginning I was sharing about mm -hmm. this guy who wanted me to know he was married. Maybe right. he saw something with Joan. He said, Kim, you're the kind of guy that might think it's good that I'm married. Mm -hmm. So this thing of seeing, and that we're called to live kind of like walking sacramentals or sacraments, right. icons of mm -hmm. the Lord. And that's, that's a big responsibility. We need the power of God to do it. But that's something we have to remember. It's not simply our sharing these things. We have to have our doctrine right, right. the truth right. But it's like are people seeing Christ in us. Mm -hmm. Only they can say it. I can't say if you are or not. But it's an incredibly powerful way to live. Yes. When you think about the new evangelization, really what does our culture need more than new evangelization regarding family and marriage life. And, right. and so that's something that Catholic families can witness to by their own example. When you live in accord with God's plan, there is a beauty, there is an attractiveness to that. You know, I like the, uh, there's a Hebrew proverb, I don't know if you've ever heard it, that God did not form woman from man's head that he might dominate her or from his feet that yeah. she might be beneath him but from his side that she might be close to his heart. That's right, beautiful. And that's really what God's plan is, that there's a mutual self-giving love yes. between the couple and that the fruit of that love yeah. is children. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then they see that they've come from love. And, and yeah. like you said, God is not an isolated being, but he's revealed himself as a trinity of persons. Yeah. There's mm -hmm. a relational. Yeah. I got a funny story about women coming from the rib, you know, when Joy and I were first <laughs> married and even as we went along and we were sleeping together and Joy would always like 
come under my arm, you know, and, and she'd be <laughs> stuck. And it was like, I was trying to sleep and she was coming in. I was kind of like, you know, why do you do that? And she said, I'm just going back where I came from. <laughs> and I thought to myself, oh, I can't, I, how beautiful is it? I'm just getting back where I came from. But now right. roll over, please. <laughs> no, no, no. Ever since that time, I never say you can't come close, but what a beautiful image yeah, it is image true, of that. right? It is. It is. I mean, that's where I came from. And, and I've always heard women say, well, I didn't come from dirt. You came from dirt. You know, and it's like, well, yeah, I kind of like that point that Carl brought out, that women are the, actually the crescendo, right, of yes. God's creation. Yeah. They were the last thing yeah. that was created. So and so beautiful. it shows the beauty of, yeah. it's not a misogynic, uh, you know, yeah. text, mm -hmm. but it's right. something that. Yeah, right. and I, I love that portion of the scripture, and I don't know the Hebrew too, but it just seems like a big exclamation point when the mm -hmm. woman is created. It's right. just like exclamation point. Yes, this at mm -hmm. last is bone of my bone and right. flesh of my flesh, and you shall be called woman. You are taken from me. I think the name for woman is, is I don't know, it's Ish and Isha. You come from me. Mm -hmm. And then she gives the life back again, and we have yes. life together, and we have children. How, how needed is this? At you this know, time? the uh, producer for this show, Debbie, is pregnant. I noticed that. <laughs> <laughs> and she I told me, was yeah. she and her husband told me that there's actually six couples here, mm -hmm. there are six women that work here at the network that are with children as well. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so we see the beauty of family life being lived out. And it's like I said, for the new evangelization, mm -hmm. we need this witness of the mm -hmm. beauty of life, the beauty of children. When children are accepted and loved and welcomed within the security of a permanent marriage, yes. it's beautiful. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yeah. I see a note up here that's saying seven now we're pregnant. Father, okay. give us a closing. <laughs> yeah, I want to okay. make sure you get that. Yeah. <laughs> Lord, yep. we thank you for the gift of life and that we have received lives through the love of our parents. And I ask you to bless all of our viewers especially those families that may be having troubles, that you would help them to find the way to mutual love and forgiveness. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Remember, Thank you're an you important Father. part of this family and you're always at home with Jim and Joy. Bye now. <laughs>